Hi there. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all, uh, both on Zoom and here, uh, for joining us today. And I also want to thank SCA. We're in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis right now. And they're also co-sponsoring their event, so very grateful for that. Um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers and then take a seat. So Ramzi Prokhawaz is the Romney's Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he teaches queer and feminist theory, oh, I guess I can take this off for the introductory part, uh, where he teaches uh, queer and feminist theory, American cultural studies, and contemporary literature. Professor Fawaz received his PhD in American Studies from Georgetown University, and so he's very at home here in our department. Um, he is the author of two monographs, including The New Mutants, Superheroes, and the Radical Imagination of American Comet, Comics, out with NYU Press in 2016. And that book won the 2017 ASAP Book Prize from the Association for the Study of Arts of the Present. And then with fast, he got <laughs> a second book, uh, which he'll be discussing today, Queer Form, also out with NYU Press in 2022. In 2018, Professor Fawaz co-edited a special issue of American literature with Derek, is that correct? It's pronounced Derek. Derek Scott, titled Queer About Comics, which was awarded the 2019 Best Special Issue of the Year from the Council of Editors of Learned Journals. He's also currently co-editing Keywords for Comic Studies with Deborah Whaley and Shelley Streeby, also forthcoming with NYU Press. His article, his articles had appeared, have appeared enviously in American Literature, Callaloo, GLQ, Feminist Studies, and the ASAP Journal. Interviewing him this evening is our very own Wei Yu Dang, a PhD student in American Studies here in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. His work primarily looks to how race, geography, and capitalism articulates U.S. foreign relations, cultural production, information industries and empire in Asia since the 19th century. He received a BA in English and history and an MA in East Asian studies, all from McGill University. And I invited Wei Yu to this event because he's also an amazing analyst of cultural and literary texts. And thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Hi. <laughs> thank you for the introduction, Josie, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you for everyone for coming out. So I think um, one way to start it, Ramsey, I'd love to hear about you know how you came to the idea of this book yeah. for writing your first book. Yeah. And if you could just you know talk about like the genesis of the argument, maybe explain some of the key terms and you know we can just do that. Sounds great. First of all, thank you all for coming out. It's such a pleasure. I, I love being with American Studies folks because that is, I'm, I now live in an English department, which I love actually. Uh, but having received my PhD in American Studies, I love being around people training in that field. Um, so Queer Forum sat in my mind for many years, um, even while I was writing The New Mutants. Um, as I, I often kind of t tell the anecdotal story that like as a young Middle Eastern gay man uh, or gay boy growing up in Orange County, California, um, I felt completely um, barred from the world of like masculinity and boyhood. And I was embraced kind of like without even a question by women and girls of like every variety of every gender expression, of every spiritual belief, of every body type, like, so, you know, every race, like so many different kinds of women embraced me. And I often say that that was my first experience of cross identification uh, that was effortless and with ease. Like it never dawned on me that like, I'm not allowed to access the world of women or womenhood. Like I felt that I belonged. And so as I kind of developed a feminist consciousness, uh, going into uh, undergraduate work at UC Berkeley, studying all with Marxist feminists, um, I began to kind of like make the connection like, oh, part of the effortlessness of that was that 
there is something about our society that makes communion between gay men and women uh, very viable, um, whatever, because of patriarchy. Like that began to dawn on me as like a young person. And so it was odd to me as I trained in American studies and queer uh, studies, that queer studies had basically like cleaved away from feminism at some point that the field had started to look at feminism as an arena of essentialist politics, that it was conservative, backward, often racist. Like that was very confusing to me. Cause I was like, I, I don't feel like, I feel deep communion with feminist thought, right? So, so one genesis of the story was that I actually wanted to go back and tell, um, I wanted to tell a different story about the mutual uh, fates of the movements for women's and gay liberation. Because the more that I went back and studied those documents from the 70s, it was very obvious that gay people and women saw their political destinies as interwoven. And it was confusing to me that queer studies had kind of let that, like had released that idea or that had disappeared. But the second side of it is really about the question of form. Uh, and, and that speaks to one of the key words of the book. Uh, you know, when I was growing up in American studies in the early 2000s, like this was the era of Lee Edelman's No Future, of Cruising Utopia, of terrorist assemblages. I mean, I remember reading those books and they like, my brain exploded into a thousand pieces, <laughs> right? And I found them so inspiring. And one of the things that unified those books, even though often they're seen as in uh, arguing against each other, was that they were developing a conception of queerness as something that is... Uh, like an ineffable energy or a force that moves throughout the social that can never be pinned down or fixed, whether it's like a utopian horizon or an assemblage, right? Like, or for Edelman, it's kind of like the birds, right? Like he gets, does that great reading of the birds where he's like, it's like a force of negativity. And at the time I found this like totally enchanting and I still do to a certain degree, but I think as I became a professor, I watched that sink into the water and I watched two or three generations of young queer and trans and feminist students become deeply convinced that queerness is at its most radical when it has no shape, when it is something that is always fleeting or exceeding capture. And yet this struck me as making them deeply miserable, effectively. Like they literally perceive their genders and sexualities as a constant source of trauma, pain, and dis catastrophic unhappiness, even while they were like hanging out with queer people in classes talking about queerness. And I was like, this notion of queerness as endlessly formless doesn't seem to actually do the work that you want it to do politically. And it also just seems psychically really distressing so like, what if we actually went back to the forms people created in this earlier moment and studied them? Like, what would that look like? And that's really what the book is, is a study of all these cultural forms from the seventies that give us different shapes of gender and sexual divergence. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah. I think um, one thing that you make really clear in, you know, the kind of summary you just gave is the importance of students and oh, yeah. having it, this kind of, active pedagogy where you're not just you know teaching but you're also responding to kind of what isn't being absorbed and i think what i found really interesting about the book and also just you know what you described is that queer forms is also a deeply historical text mm -hmm. right and it's it's a history that doesn't trace linear events or progress but yeah it's a history that do, that's done through concepts and another thing that you really make clear in the book is that it's at once a, a history of concepts, but also a history of politics. Yeah, and absolutely. It's political theory and you know its best form. So I think um, it'd be really helpful if you could talk more about you know the kind of political theory yeah. that may not be so evident in a queer studies context. Yeah. That's really allowing you to re enliven what these uh, gay and feminist thinkers are doing in the seventies. Yeah. And how we can like, this concept. You know, this gives me a great opportunity to, to give you like a little quick map of the book, right? So the book is organized, like, as you said, around co key concepts from the movements for women's and gay liberation. I start by saying like, look, you have these two movements that kind of explode onto the political scene in the late 60s, early 70s, responding to civil rights, new left politics, the student movement, which did so much to articulate um, 
kind of the, the project of racial and class freedom, but often didn't kind of attend to gender and sexuality as meaningful categories. And one of the first things that these movements start to do is to invent concepts for explaining like what is the unique nature of the oppression of women and queer people variously construed. And so what I do is I take up like six of these concepts and some of them include, I do a chapter on feminist equality discourse. I do a chapter on coming out of the closet. I do a chapter on consciousness raising. Um, I do a chapter on lesbian separatism, which is very near and dear to my heart. We could talk about a little bit more, right? Uh, among others. So there's more than that, but those are some of the kind of the key ones. And what I do is I show you how this concept, which kind of emerged out of certain activist struggles, comes to be taken up by artists, writers, and filmmakers who are fascinated by these ideas and want to imagine how to give them form, like in different kind of artistic mediums. So for instance, in my chapter on uh, consciousness raising, a uh, classic feminist idea, simple as this, women should sit in a circle and talk to each other about their experiences of sexism and misogyny. And the point of this is to be able to pool political resources to say like, oh, I thought this was just happening to me in my marriage, but actually it's happened to these 20 other women in 20 different ways. And like, what, how do we produce a kaleidoscopic view of this shared experience? So consciousness raising was seen as like the first step to being able to deprogram yourself from things like patriarchal ideology. And gay liberation very quickly borrowed from this in the early 70s and began to create their own programs for gay consciousness raising. So in that chapter, I look at the movie, The Boys in the Band. This fascinating and much despised, but absolutely brilliant uh, movie based on a play that ran a thousand shows off Broadway that is about a group of gay men living on the Upper West Side who um, meet to celebrate someone's birthday. And then the night erupts into an evening of screaming of basically the men sitting in a circle and screaming at each other about their experiences of homophobia. And what I say is like the movie was astounding because it modeled for mass audiences. Like this was a mass marketed Hollywood film of all out gay people that had never happened before um, in, the, in the film industry. It modeled for audiences the idea that ordinary, quotidian, you know, everyday experience could be a site for consciousness raising. Like you didn't need to be a feminist activist to sit in a circle with your friends and talk about what was happening to you. And I show how the film formalizes this, not only through the geometric form of the circle, right? An actual shape that comes to be inhabited by queer people, but it does this through its use of shot reverse shot so that you're constantly moving between members of the circle. And the film is training you formally to think about how to make judgments about the emergent experience of gay male life in the 70s. And so the more I wrote about it that way, the more I realized like that's political theorizing. The film is actually asking like, how do you make judgments about collective life? Like that's the central core of political theorizing is like, what does it mean to live in public together? And so, in some ways, I did kind of come to admit as I wrote this book that I am really a political theorist at some level. I'm a feminist political theorist. And I could tell because there were people like Linda Zarelli, who I cite a lot, a, a, a key feminist political theorist for my thinking, who were reading the manuscript and being like, oh, you're doing political theory through popular culture. Um, and so the way that I do that is I ask um, not like what is the uh, what are the ideological messages of these texts? I'm actually asking how do they allow people to cognize public life in new ways and surprising ways? Um, I don't know if that fully answered that question. I, I started yeah. meandering and then I, I mean, yeah. I think, I think that's a great setup for understanding what exactly you mean by form. Yeah, right. And it's like the form that you are addressing isn't just genre critique. No. It's not just kind of like close reading different like structures, but it's a kind of openness to form. And so you, yes. you have like this tension between what is a queer form and what is queer formalism. Yes. And the kind of suggestion is that all forms have a capacity to be queer. Yes, absolutely. In the same way that kind of all these stories have a capacity to be mm -hmm. queer. And it's almost, a it's, it is the political project of the queer formalist to kind of see the multiple possibilities, right? It is exactly, it's a, it's yeah. a type of reading. I mean, I'll just, if, if, uh, you know, in, in a nutshell, my conception of form really works like this. 
Uh, and I draw this from this brilliant feminist politi uh, literary theorist at Brown University, Ellen Rooney, has this amazing essay called Form and Contentment that is like, everybody in American studies needs to read it. It's truly, yes, I agree. And part of what she says in this, it's, it's, a, it's a polemical piece. And she says, look, like, um, basically everybody in cultural studies at some point decided that they had to fight against formalism because they had to fight against the conservatism of literary studies. And on the flip side, literary scholars felt that they had to defend formalism to the death against cultural studies, which had been, uh, which was perceived of as diluting the field by saying, well, we're going to study everything from like a rave to a novel. <laughs> and she's like, they need each other, by the way. She's like, there is no such thing as studying anything in the world without formalism because everything's a shape. Everything that appears in the world has some kind of form and there is no way you can dispense with formalism. On the flip side, she's like, literary studies should be so glad that cultural studies basically said your entire purview of your field has no limit. It expanded the, the, the network of things that literary studies could study. So she has a very interesting conception of form that I also borrow where she's like, look, there's one way of thinking about form as the actual like formal strategies or techniques of cultural objects, like a metaphor is a form, right? Or allegory. But she's like, form is actually a problematic of reading. It is the thing that happens when a reader or viewer encounters a cultural text, sees the forms the text is offering to the viewer and then reshapes them in their imagination. Like every time you do that, the form is created anew in your mind, which means that the interpretive possibilities of any cultural text are infinite. It's infinitely mobile. And so she's saying that actually makes our work a lot harder and requires us to be a lot more rigorous. And she's like, but here's what's happened in cultural studies. We've just fallen back on theory and ideology to tell us what the text means. We stopped actually caring how our reading of the text changes it and makes it into something new. We just read Judith Butler and then are like performativity, <laughs> intersectionality, Afro-pessimism, whatever, like, right? Like people just laminate some concept they love on the cultural text. And she's like, that destroys it. That destroys the capacity of the text to do something new. And in some ways, I felt like this is what was happening to 1970s women's gay liberation in contemporary social justice discourse, where what I watched was my students laminate contemporary concepts like intersectionality, like onto those, those movements and basically dismiss them as like transphobic, racist, you know, whatever, myopic. And I was like, you haven't even read any of the texts that these movements produced. Like you don't even know what they could offer you because you haven't even deigned to like take the time to watch like feminist and queer movies or read political documents from this period. Like, and so when I, when I teach the queer and feminist seventies, my students are like mind boggled when they read the dialectic of sex by Shulamith Firestone, right? Or when they read the original document, like when we read uh, this bridge called my back, you know, writings by radical women of color all the way through like cover to cover, they are like, this is actually even more complex than some contemporary intersectional thought. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like you wouldn't have known unless you went back and read it before you judged it. And so, yeah, like that. So my conception of form is about the imaginative practice of giving something a shape and then imbuing it with a certain kind of meaning. And a queer form is any kind of shape, mold, pattern that comes to be inhabited by some aspect of gender and sexual divergence, which is why, as you pointed out, like to me, it's like, not every form is a queer one, but it could be. What, and that's what I say in the book, right? With the right imagination. Yeah, and like this focus on imagination and world making, yeah. I, I think is really kind of the thrust of what yeah. you want a reader to do. And so I'd love it if you could talk more about how do we get from that point of, you know, as you described it, your students, you know, imputing theory on text, yes. right? How do we get from the point of doing theory to text yeah. to having as you call it, a friendship with form, yeah. and a friendship with the objects, a friendship with yeah. the Well, and I mean, I can, that, maybe I can describe a little bit of like my method then, yeah. because right, in some ways, uh, so much of the book is grounded in close reading, which is kind of what I think I do best, like very historically and theoretically informed, but not but, uh, close reading, but that doesn't collapse into only theory or history. Um, 
So you had asked me a little bit earlier about what I mean by a queer formalist. And I say at the beginning, I, I, I list like a number of, of different strategies that somebody that I would think of as a queer formalist uh, practices. And one of those strategies is the suspension of ideological critique in order to ask not um, how is this text sending me a message, right, about some kind of like trying to get me to believe something, but rather what are the possibilities of the shapes that it provides me, right? So like um, I talk in the lesbian separatism chapter, I talk about these very weird science fiction films, Zardoz, which you haven't seen, you should absolutely see, and Bored in Flames. And I basically say these movies are, are actually about the, sep the, the logic of separation and self-definition. Like lesbian separatists in the 70s believed that there was no such thing as reforming patriarchy. Why fight this structural thing that is never going to change? Let's divest in an anarchist way from male-dominated society. It's an amazing idea. Uh, and a deeply anarchist one. It's also a miserably failed uh, project, right? Because it collapsed into a certain kind of identitarianism. It was like the idea that lesbians believed that if they went and lived on communes by themselves, they would find universal sisterhood and be liberated. But of course, as everyone in this room has experienced, you will seek out people of your so-called own identity and then you'll discover that you don't like half of them, <laughs> maybe more than half of them, <laughs> right? And what you'll really discover in the process of actually building a politics is that you have deep, unexpected and unpredictable affinities with people who are nothing like you. And that is like the strength of politics. But so what I say is that Zardoz and Born in Flames, they do all these amazing visual things to try and describe to the viewer, like what does it mean to separate and what is the purpose of separation? So in Zardoz, there is this utopian commune that literally has a sealed glass dome around it. And they're obsessed with mitigating harm. They have these crystals inside their head that allow them to mirror each other's thoughts. So you get all of these things like hydroponic bubbles and crystals and mirrors that literally give form to the lesbian separatist fantasy of the mirroring of political ideals. So when I first watched Zardoz, I remember just being mind boggled by it. It's like a bizarre experimental postmodern science fiction film. Um, uh, John Connery is in a red loincloth for the entire movie. So if that isn't enough for you to go watch it tonight, like, I don't know, I don't know what is. But what fascinated me is like, it's so easy to do an ideological read of this film. So like film critic, Marsha Kinder writes this brilliant takedown of the film for Film Quarterly in the late 1970s. And she's like, it's fascist. It's like all about white masculinity, like um, entering this idyllic commune and destroying it, blah, 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 blah. And I remember when I watched the movie and I was like, no, that's not what I got out of it at all. Like the movie explained to me the logic of lesbian separatism. So instead of trying to go after the movie and deconstruct it, I was like, I'm gonna show the reader how the movie taught me this thing, right? Like I'm interested in how cultural texts allow you again, I use the word cognize, to like cognize a way of thinking that was never accessible to you before. And to me, the movie explained what separatism is. And it was because of that, that I was able to then at the end of that chapter say, hey, guess what? Contemporary social justice politics claims that it is the opposite of lesbian separatism. It is against the whiteness of separatism. It's against its essentialism. It's against all these things. And then I'm like, actually, they're the same thing. Like so much social justice discourse today is lesbian separatism by another name. We want to separate from the sources of our oppression. We are going to theorize our specific identity, trans, trans of color, right up disabled, like we named the entire list as a uniquely oppressed object that it needs its own analysis. Mm -hmm. I'm on board with all of that, by the way. It's the third move that's always the mistake, which is, and then we're gonna elevate our particular category of oppression to the height of a spiritual calling. And there is almost no identity movement since the seventies that has ever been able to escape that will to power, the desire to then say, but our category is the most abject, the most oppressed, the most whatever. And part of what I show is I'm like, this is what lesbian separatists said in the 70s. They were like, the lesbian is the most hated category of all time. We're hated by straight men, we're hated by gay men, we're hated by straight women. Like, of course, we're the most radical, right? And then everybody else came along and said, no, but us. No, but we're the most radical. 
So part of what I say is like, let's learn from that. Let's, let's take the best part of separatism, which is its anarchism, like its whole project of like, let's just beat Dodge. Let's just like get like separate from the thing that's destroying us. And then let's jettison the rest that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was like such a brilliant reading of how like separatism is just everywhere. And also just kind of- Safe space is like a separatist yeah. practice. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's about like, I want to separate and be with people like me. And, and I'm just like, we should actually remember that that's, that's the ultimate project is communion. Like to me, the ultimate project of radical left politics is cross identification and communion, which will require at the end of the day, a release of proprietary hold on most identities, if not all. And that's dangerous and risky in a world where identities feel always under siege. Yeah. I'd love it if you could talk more about, you know, how do we salvage identity politics? Yeah. Tendency? And, you know, I find the first chapter is really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like kind of thinking about what does it mean to be a replicant uh -huh. as both like a clone and someone who's in dialogue? Yeah. And yeah, so I mean, yeah. I if you could talk more about that. So the first chapter of the book is about feminist equality discourse in the 70s. We tend to look back now and say equality, oh, liberal, right? Like, oh, it's such a liberal project. It's all about sameness with men. It's all about political reform. And I'm like, uh, uh, wait, first of all, it, we would be so lucky if we had anything near equality, <laughs> right? For women or queer people or and you name it, right? Like we should be so lucky if the liberal version of it succeeded. But second, I say it actually was not a liberal project in a sense. What so many feminists in the 60s who were who we now associate with like liberal white feminism, but in fact was a multiracial coalition of women who were brought together um, first uh, by John F. Kennedy in um, what is it in the, the National Commission on like the state of women like that was a multiracial coalition of women who would end up going to create what we now call like second wave feminism like the beginnings of it. They were not simply asking for parity with men. They were saying, we need to completely reorganize every institutional structure of US society to attend to the needs of both women and men. So for instance, they put forward the idea of universal childcare, not only for women, but also for men. They were like, if both men and women were freed to be able to use their full resources outside of child rearing, the whole society would transform radically. Like that's an amazing idea. So part of what I say is I say, look, feminist political theorists remind us that equality is never about sameness. It's not about A equals A, it's about A equals B. It's about saying there are two very different things. What would be required for the society to value those both things in the same way? And if you value two different things the same way, you would attend to their distinctions and their differences. You would say, this person is trans and needs this particular kind of healthcare. This person is disabled and needs this kind of access, right? Like equality is about the negotiation of differences. It's a very difficult, hard thing to accomplish. And so what I say in the first chapter is I reclaim that more radical conception of equality from the 70s. And I say a variety of writers in this period were fascinated with what does it take imaginatively to make two people who are so different equivalently valuable. And what writers invented, I, I argue in the chapter, is this figure, a form that I call the female replicant. The idea of a, a clone, a double, a ghostly avatar, um, of, of a woman that is supposed to be identical to her, but turns out it's another woman. So I look at Ira Levitt's The Stepford Wives, right? This very famous novella about the fantasy that a group of women are being replaced by robots, literal replicants. I look at Joanna Russ's The Female Man, which if you haven't read it, is, will transform your whole life. Um, a lesbian feminist science fiction novel about a group of women who begin to uh, meet each other across different dimensions and discover that they're technically the same woman from like multiple versions of Earth. And then I look at Maxine Hunkingston's The Woman Warrior, um, 
the arguably the most important work of Asian American uh, literature ever written, that is about one woman's attempt to understand her own life through the prismatic lives of all the other women that make up her family. And part of what I say is that in every one of these texts, writers are trying to imagine what it would look like for a woman to have to encounter another woman who she thought was going to be the same as her, but discovers is nothing like her. Um, and how do they negotiate those differences? And all of these writers invent a variety of really interesting formal strategies for doing this. So in The Female Man, Joanna Russ imagines um, th that each of the characters is saying some of the same lines at the same time. So you become confused about who's speaking and you have to kind of parse them uh, like while you're looking at the text. And the text becomes a ballistic experience of women exchanging ideas and then having to differentiate themselves from each other over and over and over again. And so ultimately what I say in that chapter is that contemporary social justice discourse has a lot to learn from the logic of equality rather than jettisoning it. Because our version of equality today is the idea of universal inclusion. My students are obsessed with universal inclusion. Everyone needs to be included in every space all the time. I'm like, what about consent? I'm like, isn't consent fundamentally exclusive? Like, aren't you saying like, no, you can't have sex with me. You can. Like, you're, you're, you're making decisions and distinctions. And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so then you're fascist by your own logic. And I'm like, it doesn't that not make sense? So I remind them, I'm like, inclusion sometimes is a deeply important value. And sometimes it doesn't make sense politically. You would have to decide case by case. So I remind them that in some ways, while they claim to value difference so much, I actually think their obsession with ideas like universal inclusion are actually about the desire to not have to negotiate difference. To say, everyone's included, I love everybody, that's it. And I'm like, how would you know when one group or another group needs something politically if you didn't make distinctions? Equality is something that can be reclaimed today as a way for people invested in social justice to actually make meaningful distinctions between different political interests uh, and different identities and different groups. And that would require taking shape. Like you can't just collapse people into formlessness. Yeah, and I think it's like part of the idea of forms is like the insistence that so much of what politics is, is kind of making decisions. Absolutely, and like judgment. And something like formlessness and fluidity is often like an evasion yes. of wanting to take shape. Can I say something quickly about that? I know, I know I've been going on at late, but I, you know, I've been saying in a lot of the conversations I've been having, right, judgment is a, a concept that's very important to me in this book. The idea that like, we cannot move forward politically without making judgment calls about things, about which we may change later. And I actually have really grown to feel that in some ways, um, the insistence on a certain kind of obsession with gender and sexual fluidity, uh, which sits under a logic of formlessness, escaping or evading all shape, speaks to me about a deep desire to not be judged. And I really understand where it comes from. Like I look at my students and my students are like, I have grown up in this deeply transphobic, homophobic, you name it, right? The list goes on society. And I feel so unfairly judged so often because of my gender and sexual expression, can I not just stop being judged? And my thing to them is I'm like, if you wanna create another world collectively with other queer people and your allies, you will have to be judged by them. Like you will have to put forward ideas that people might disagree with, versions of your own identity as well as versions of the world you want to see created. And I remind them, you have every right to say, I do not want to be unfairly judged in a way that is actively trying to diminish me. But that's different than being judged by other people politically who are invested in mutual transformation. And you have to be open to that. And I think fluidity often to me as a concept is about an evasion. It's like a refusal. Like the thing I always think about is my students are basically like, I'm desperate to be understood, but you'll never understand me. You know, because they don't actually want you to read them because then they'll be like, but then am I being fixed? And I'm like, no, somebody's just giving you their one perspective on what they see when they see you. Allow them to do that and then respond. And that's what judgment is, is that dialogic back and forth, which I think fluidity often wants to avoid. 
Let's just not, talk. I'm just anything and everything all at once. Let's not talk about it. And I can see my students kind of like want to run away from the conflictual inner engagement. I'm interested in how, you know, your students respond to this idea of like shape shifting. Yeah, I, yeah. Is this like the shape shifter is kind of doing this work yeah. of fluidity innovation, but it's also a kind of multiplication of form, Yeah. Right, so how do you, yeah. how do they kind of respond to your argument that one of the most interesting queer forms is the shape shifting? Yeah. So in the book, I introduced the notion of shape shifting as an alternative to the popularity of the concept of fluidity. And I say shape shifting might describe more accurately the kind of slow and steady process by which we change or transform over time in response, like the, anything, our genders, our sexualities, our conception of our race, our right, any anything, right? That to me, fluidity masks the clumsiness of the process. Like if things were so fluid that they were liquid in nature, like you just wake up and be whatever it is that you want to be tomorrow, you wouldn't even have to explain yourself because you just would be it, right? The fact that we're always struggling to articulate a sense of self in the world means that the process is laborious, it's difficult, and it's clumsy. And I think that we should have language that does justice to that clumsiness, because if we did, we might be more generous and loving towards each other as we go through that process and make mistakes and get confused about ourselves and other people, et cetera. I have found that when I introduce a lot of these ideas to my students, they live. They're like obsessed because they feel exhausted of the recriminatory wounded logic where they are desperate to look at their peers, many of whom are very frustrating to them and like tell it like it is. And they're like, that person's going to yell at me that I hurt them. And I, and he said, like, there's so much like invasion of conflict that everyone is in a stalemate and everyone feels that they're always wrong. And I basically say, if you imagine yourself as a shapeshifter, like you're allowed to be wrong. You're allowed to put forward a different form and see what people respond and then change right, over and over and over again. And in a sense, it gives them permission to explore. And I remind them, I'm like, fluidity is not actually formless. You think it is. It's just another form. Like I can imagine in my head, it's like water or, or liquid or something, right? Like we will create a shape for everything. So I remind them, like, you don't have to be trapped in the idea of a dialectic where like, Fluidity is over here and rigidity is over here and you always have to be this thing in order to be pol politically progressive. And, and so I think that the idea of shape-shifting helps them escape that dialectic altogether. And to see their, pro their job as being imaginative, like inventing new ways of, in of inhabiting the world with others. I think one instance of kind of being open to being wrong in the book that I found mm. really interesting was how Tales of the City oh, yeah. kind of addressed these critiques of not being inclusive enough. Yeah, yeah. Kind of not only representing like a white gay man's yeah. perspective. And, you know, I'd love it if you could talk about, if, you know, this can be an opportunity yeah. about seriality and also to bring in the discussion of race. Totally. I, I'm, and I have to say, I'm so grateful to both um, the Asian American historian Cindy Chang and Jennifer Duvier Brody uh, at Stanford. Um, the queer study scholar, a theater scholar there. They both, when I first started working on Tales of the City, how many of you are familiar with Tales? It's oh, so good, it's so beautiful and amazing. Tales of the City was the most popular gay serial fiction of the 70s. It was a story that was told in daily installments in the San Francisco Chronicle, which was the most, it was like the New York Times of the Bay Area, the most widely circulated mass newspaper of the time. It was astounding that the newspaper decided to publish a story that was a fiction in like in between journalistic news that was written by a gay white man, Armistead Maupin, who wanted to tell a story about queer people's sex lives in the city and the sex lives of their straight friends. So it's astounding that a story like this appeared in a mainstream newspaper and it circulated the experience of gay life in San Francisco to a mass audience. So one of the things I wanted to do in this chapter, I wanted to know what it was like to read it in the newspaper in the 70s, because later it became novelized. It was then turned into a PBS TV show. It was like, it now has a huge cultural currency, like Netflix did their own revival of it. 
but there's something about reading it with thousands of hundreds of thousands of other people that is hard to recapture today. So I interviewed 30 people who read it in its original form in the 70s. And that was really like a, an amazing, amazing experience. But when I first wrote about it, I wrote about all of the utopian aspects of it, how it like made queerness accessible to uh, straight audiences, all of this stuff. And both Jennifer and Cindy were like, I love this, I'm on board, but like, why is it so white? Like, what, like you have to explain that. Like you really need to explain why it is that it's so radical on the question of gender and sexuality, but in some ways, so unable to deal with any kind of experience outside of whiteness. So I did like a deep dive around the text and I found something that, I, that, that just really blew my mind. So at some point in the story, um, Maupin introduces a black character, a black woman who's a really amazing character, Dorothea Wilson, um, who is like a model in the modeling industry and she's a lesbian. And at one point she comes out as white. It's discovered that she's been taking melanin pills uh, in order to, because it's like she became exotic and then people wanted her to be a model. And it's a kind of an, a, a hilarious but awful moment in which the, the narrative goes from having one major character of color to zero. And everybody was always like, why did this happen? And it turns out that Maupin received a letter after he'd been writing this character for a while um, from an African-American woman who said, um, I feel like you've created this character who's really a white woman in black woman's skin. Um, and like, who are you basically to, to be able to tell the story of a black woman? Like you don't have the right to do that. And I, I do a really deep reading of this moment where I'm like, this is a really, excuse me, it's like a really, really fucked up moment of, of, of mutual identitarianism. So the way I interpret it is somebody from the black community is saying, I know what blackness is. I've decided that you are failing to represent it adequately. And I'm gonna tell you that you don't have a right to do it this way. But then he is freaking out about the fact that people have been criticizing him, that who is he to tell the story of all gay people as a white gay man who cannot possibly speak for all gay people. And the moment makes me really just sad because he decides as an artist, you know what, you're right. I don't have a right to tell the black experience, but if I say that I don't, then I can claim to have a right over the thing I do know, which is gayness. And basically what happens is that gayness and blackness become put back in their place, like in this moment, like a mutual moment of identitarian policing leads to all of these things becoming separated from each other, as opposed to Maupin saying, that is really interesting. I wanna know what is your version of blackness? What would a black character look like who you would believe, right? Like this would have taken creative work for him to find out. It would have also required his audience to allow him to do that and to make mistakes. And I found that moment really, really telling because it's a moment when in the late seventies, the really imaginative and like, let me put it this way. You'd ask me about like, how do we think about identity politics today? Like, just so we remember, identity politics in the seventies as it was articulated by the Kambahi River Collective was nothing more nor less than like positionality. The idea that like where you stand in the world is meaningful. If you are an African-American trans man from the Bronx, that means something. Like the way you see the world gives you insight. It doesn't mean that you have essential universal knowledge. It simply means that like your view on the world matters. What identity politics would later become is more accurately described by identitarianism. The collapse of someone's position into a universal proprietary owned object or identity that then gives somebody like rightful claim over it in a kind of inviolable way. And that moment that this happens, I argue kind of in the book, signals the moment that identity politics begins to collapse into identitarianism in the late seventies. And it is a really, really unfortunate thing because it means that cross identification begins to collapse. And I think we should fight against that personally. And I think like the way that in the book sequence, you have this chapter and then you have the chapter of sexual pluralism. Yeah, yeah. 
And there's like all of these different tactics that are applied to how do we represent different kinds yeah. of experience. And yeah. So I'd love if you could talk about like, the relationship between seriality yeah. in, in the moment and then the sequencing yeah. of these comics, like how people were yeah. in that sense. And almost like, why is it that we can have a plurality of sexualities, but race is kind of the threshold? Of oh, I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have things to say about that. Yeah. Well, um, so chapters four and five are all about seriality as something that seems formless, like the idea of indefinite unfolding seems formless, but in fact, literary forms like serial narrative or comics art, like sequential art, actually give shape to the experience of things that unfold. So in the fifth chapter, as you were pointing out, I kind of do like a, a double take on Tales of the City because I, I look at two really important queer artists, Joe Brainerd and David Wojnarowicz, and I show how like they were artists who became really obsessed with comics at some point in their fine art careers and began to experiment with ways of describing gay erotic desire as kind of an infinitely multiplicious unfolding sequence of images that can never be pinned down, right? In, in any one way. So, wait, remind me again the second part of your question. I was wondering about like, why is it we have sexual pluralisms? That oh yes, race. about race. Okay, great. So, um, so part of what I what, what I try to show in those two chapters is that serial form lends itself to more flexible understandings of gender and sexuality that approximate the spirit of fluidity without collapsing into formlessness. Like seriality demands the giving shape over and over and over to something, and I, I say at some point like it approximates. Munoz's notion of the utopian horizon, like if you keep producing an endless series of sequential uh, images, you will like approximate the actual diversity of erotic desire, but you'll never get there, right? Because it's infinite, unmultiplicious. But so this is a question I ask through, like in the beginning of the book, especially, why are gender and sexuality given so much space to be flexible, transitional and open-ended, but race is not. Um, and one of, the, one of the, th the claims that I make at the beginning of the book is from my own research into social movements in the 60s and 70s, I think one of many answers to that question is that it is merely an artifact of the social movement history of the 60s and 70s. The civil rights movement and then later black power were not interested fundamentally in dissolving blackness as an identity or as a racial category. They were interested like the Asian American movement and, and um, the Chicano movement. They were interested in wresting back control of categories like uh, Latinx identity or black identity from white supremacy and then reconstituting them as sources of pride around which racialized subjects could organize. So when the black power movement kind of has its you know, Afrocentric revival and, and then black arts movement and whatever, the point was not to try to get white people to want to be black. It was to try and get global black subjects to be invested in blackness as a radical um, a form of identification. But the movements for women's and gay liberation, while they certainly had their own version of essentialism, right? Lesbian separatism could be very essentialist about the category of woman. Generally speaking, those movements were actually interested in deconstructing the categories of gender and sexuality. Like the gay liberation movement wanted to make everyone gay, right? They wanted to recruit people into queerness in many ways. That's what coming out of the closet was about. The idea was that if you declared your sexuality, other people might do the same. It wasn't about declaring a truth of the self. It was about recruiting people. And so I think one of the artifacts of that is that we were, these were two strategies, right? They're two legitimate strategies the consolidation of identity and the dissolution of identity. And in some ways, we are the beneficiaries of a view of gender and sexuality as flexible and open-ended and of race as not. And in some ways in the book, I question that a little bit, right? It's like now it's completely acceptable for everyone to dress in drag, but the idea of somebody crossing racial lines is completely unacceptable. And I think it's worth asking why, you know, why one and why not the other? And I think that some of those ideas, yes, you can argue 
that, for instance, something like blackface has a history of extraordinary violence towards black bodies. But one could also argue that cross-dressing also has a history of violence towards women. So I don't think it's as easy as we would like to believe to make the distinction. I think it's worth debating. And I agree with, you know, this is such an old school reference. I agree with David Hollinger, the intellectual historian in Post-Ethnic America, a, a text that seems passe now, but I think was really powerful in the 90s, where he says, like, if we really are striving towards an anti-racist world, are we trying to imagine a world in which everyone who has been racialized has more of an opportunity to suspend the power of that category on their lives so that they can identify across race with other people and vice versa. And I feel like we need to create space for that. Yeah. And I think you get like two really good words for it. You talk about adjacency. Yes. And affinity. Yes. So really important words for me. Yeah. And so I wanted to, I'm trying to think of a segue from this. Yeah. The last chapter. Oh, I'll sure. Discuss, but it's still. I don't know, it seems a bit oh, too yeah. far of a leap. Oh, that's okay. But I was wondering if you could maybe like, you know, try to introduce it in describing your relationship to like theories of liberalism, right? Because like yeah. we were talking about it and there's like, there's an approach, there's, you know, the common sense of like queer studies of liberalism is bad. Yeah, that it's, while that's everybody's like, going to a university and like yeah. having a liberal education. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think your advice yeah. is there are good stuff. Absolutely. There's like positive yeah. things that we can learn from it. And, you know, I, I'm trying to make the connection because there's- a No, I can, I can, I can also this, help make yeah, that. Um, there's a section where you talk about illiberalism. Yes. Uh -huh. Where it's like this performance of disgust yeah. is a way to kind of reckon with the realities yeah. and the positive. Yeah. If, sure. You know, if you could- Yeah. The that. last chapter does something very weird. And in fact, in some ways, if, if anybody's ever followed some of my publications, I the book started with the last chapter, which is really counterintuitive. It started with this piece I published in GLQ on Angels in America. They had done a special issue about eight or nine years ago called On the Visceral. And how many people have seen Angels in America? Such an incredible, important, you know, you know, one of, considered one of the most important plays written in the late 20th century, beloved by many, also critiqued for its liberalism by many. And what intrigued me when I saw the play the first time, I was so moved by it. It's an epic, like six, seven hour play, um, is how much it's obsessed with bowel movements. I was like fascinated by how much like all of the characters are like experiencing diarrhea or constipation or hemorrhoids or vomiting or bleeding ulcers. And I started reading scholarship on the play, which is voluminous. I mean, there's so much, nobody ever mentions this ever. That shocked me. So I started percolating on this idea that the form at the center of that play is the gut. It's like the actual ailmentary tract. It's like all of the different shapes that like make up that, the esophagus and the stomach or whatever. And I do this reading where I say, here's what is extraordinary about this play. The play says, the problem with liberalism it's, it's abstraction. It's not the idea that human beings can be perceived of as equally valued. Like the, the play is like, that's a good thing. The idea that human beings should be valued in their humanity, the idea that like uh, people should be perceived of as willful subjects who can have choice over their life. The play is like, there's, that's not that terrible. The play is like, what takes that in the wrong direction is that liberalism wants to imagine an abstracted humanity that is universal. And the abstraction, as we know, is usually almost always like a white straight man, whatever, right? And the play is like, what would it look like to make liberalism account for its abstraction, to force the liberal tradition to face the thing it cannot face, which is the disgusting, messy, visceral reality of individual humans who live and grow and die and have endless dysfunction. So it's actually, a, it's like a queer crip reading of the liberal tradition. It's a beautiful moment at the beginning when one of the main characters, Lewis, who is like one of the villains of the play for a long time because he abandons his, his partner when his partner contracts HIV AIDS. And he says at one point, like, I can't deal with like sores and sickness or whatever, but he's always thinking of himself as a good liberal and other people in the play are like, you're a terrible liberal because like when it actually, when the chips are down, you can't deal with it. You claim that you believe in universal humanity, but you can't deal with real human beings being sick, which is what the nature of existence is. So what's beautiful is that the play imagines all of these forms, like a great one 
is the Im image of the bleeding heart. Um, what is it like? Uh, it's it's like a, a ble bleeding into a universe of wounds. There's an amazing moment when the angel, this, there's a character in it who's, who's literally an angel from heaven. She talks to this other character who has HIV AIDS and she describes his heart as a, a battered heart bleeding life into a universe of wounds. She is repurposing the image of the bleeding heart liberal. And she's saying, what if you imagined a heart that has that is that is pumping eight blood with HIV, but that if that blood was going everywhere, it wouldn't infect the world, it would connect everybody, right? It would, it would actually be like, it would recognize our shared wounding in this world. So part of what I say is that the play tries to invoke in the viewer disgust about bowel dysfunction in order to make you feel disgusted, not with people with HIV AIDS, but with the government neglect. It tries to reuse form to reroute your disgust. And I think, I, as you pointed out, I call this illiberalism, like two words. It imagines a liberalism that is attuned to people's messy, visceral um, dysfunction. And, and, and I think that the play tries to imagine what liberalism would look like if it attended to that reality. And it produces something really quite radical and amazing. And I think that's a great way to get to the end of your meditation on freedom. Yeah. There's a footnote where you talk about how freedom and friendship. Yeah. An yeah. Root. Mm -hmm. I think it, it would be remiss if we didn't talk about Thelma and Louise. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like Moonlight. Yeah. And I love how you. Which, is a, which book and the book. Exactly. Mm -hmm. As, and it's not. And you, you talk about like the critiques by of some students. Some sure. People that. Yeah. Why, why don't they just come out? Yeah. Why are <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was wondering if you could talk more about um, why frame it. Yeah. As a, why frame queer forms as a problem of friendship? Yeah. And also, there's this critique of care. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the conclusion that I'm really interested in. Yeah, yeah. I'd love it if you could talk more about that. Sure. So um, the book really, I would say my own investment is like my conception of freedom is drawn from the Arendtian tradition, from Hannah Arendt, and her conception that freedom is only uh, something that exists in the world when people come together and act collectively. Um, to transform the conditions of their existence. That's her conception of power too, right? She's like, power springs up between men when they act together and it disperses when they're no longer engaged with each other. And so for me, freedom is really about communion. A lot of this book is me saying to contemporary social justice discourse, like you are so concerned with the problem of harm and woundedness that you are forgetting that the ultimate project here is to produce points of connection, right? If you double down on woundedness enough, as Wendy Brown reminds us classically in Wounded Attachment, the reality is that late capitalism has wounded all of us, including the people who wield most of its power. You know, people like Dorothy Dinnerstein, a brilliant feminist psychoanalyst that people don't read now, but they should. You know, she was one of the first people to argue in the 70s. She was like, patriarchy psychologically warps men in ways that are astounding and it damages them horribly. And she's like, we actually have to acknowledge things like that, you know? And so for me, um, woundedness will ultimately fail if it's the raison d'etre of politics. It could be the beginning of politics. You can say, we've realized that we are wounded. So we now need to do something about it. Like, I'm all for that. But when the raison d'etre, the entire purpose of politics becomes articulating woundedness, what ends up happening, which we see today in Trumpism, is like, I'm wounded by your woundedness. Right? It's like the endless recriminatory cycle of people. And the reality that like, you know, you read a book like Deaths of Despair, it's like there's a lot of white people who are also in hell, right, in this country. And so it's not so easy as to say like, well, these people are wounded, these people are not. So the book really stresses the idea of a conception of freedom about the ability to commune across our differences. And I try to point out that a lot of the tension between different factions of women's and liberation white women, uh, African-American women, Asian-American women, you know, trans women, all of these divisions that we look back and we think that they're so obvious. A lot of those divisions were really about the deep frustration of the inability to commune across difference. Like a lot of the interests of white women and black women in the women's movement were very much aligned, but because of the history of structural racism, it made communion really difficult. And that really made people frustrated. Like that's a lot of what the anger and frustration was about. 
So at the end of the book, I do a long meditation on friendship as to my mind, one of the most lasting and long lived concepts to emerge out of these movements. The idea of friendship as an unpredictable affinity that sprung up between women and queer people variously construed, like in the act of fighting for their freedom. And I argue that friendship is something that survives past the rise and fall of movements. And I point out that today, the logic of canceling um, basically makes friendship impossible. Like canceling is, is about actually destroying communion. It's about saying like foreclosing the possibility of things like forgiveness, disagreement, right? Like, like meaningful conflict. And I say like, what would it look like to draw upon friendship, not only as a social form, but almost like a method for studying culture, for looking at culture and saying, my job is to commune with a movie or with a cultural text, is to be in a dialogic interaction, which might also mean that the, that, that object will betray my self-image because that's what friendship is. It is a betrayal. It's somebody looking at you and saying, I see you, but I see you in a way that you may not have recognized. And I say in the contemporary culture of harm reduction on the left, that makes friendship impossible. Because if the point of a friend in that framework is to minister to your wounds, they can never disagree with you. They can never tell you when you are like going sideways. You know, they, I often joke with my students, it's so difficult for them to look at members of their social justice communities and say, actually, I don't think this is a microaggression. I think you're annoying, right? Like, I actually think in this moment, you're interpersonally being a very difficult person to work with. And like, that is not reducible to ideology. They can't have those conversations. And that makes friendship impossible because everything is reduced to the weight of a structural reality. And not all things are structural at all times in the same way. Um, and so I, I basically argue for friendship as like a, as a form of dialogic interaction between two people that is a mutual judging and, de and deciding about where we will move together. Yeah. We're about I, I think maybe we should open. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. How much time do we have? Like 10, 15 minutes? Uh, no, we actually have 20 minutes. Oh, beautiful. Great. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Those are great Thank questions. You. So we can also, uh, if Robert will explain how, how do we take questions? Oh, from yeah. Zoom? Well, there aren't any yet, but they're. Yeah, but we have a lot of people on Zoom. Oh, that's so great. Ask people yeah. to ask questions on Zoom. Yeah, so hey, everybody on Zoom, if you have questions, is it like they should put them in the chat box? Q &A. Okay, in the Q&A, that'd be great. And then Robert will read them. <laughs> oh, I know, that always happens. <laughs> Let's start with questions from the audience. Anybody? I really like you talking about um, how things are, nothing can be formless. Yeah. Um, because of the sheer fact that we can sexualize things. Yeah. Um, but you talked about finding, oh, what is this? <laughs> you talked about, um, oh, is it? Am I not working? Okay. 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 Oh, I have the wireless one. Yeah. Um, you talk about, um, it's picking up finding form yeah. in our text. Uh-huh. Um, I'm in uh, my professor's um, pronounced uh -huh. and we read a lot of difficult texts um, and texts that are kind of like extraneous in a sense and taxing on the mind. Sure. Um, and I want to add, that's not like an insult or No, I don't read it. I don't see it that way. Yeah. But um, I want to know how, if you can explain more how to find this form of text and how to read it more like openly. Yeah. Have it not be so like stressful because yes. you have to assign these like labels onto it. Beautiful. It's yeah. a great question. So number one, suspend your ideological analysis. Suspend having decided what the text is doing in advance. You do not know, you cannot know in advance of the reading. And in fact, 
you might read the same text seven times at seven different moments. If any of you become professors, <laughs> if you have the good fortune of continuing on to teach, you're gonna teach the same text sometimes like 10 years in a row. I have taught Sula every year for about nine years. And my students read it differently every time. I now have a very strong reading of the text. Like, right? So like, I sometimes get bored of myself because I feel in a way like I'm sucking all the air out of the room. This last time I taught it, my students read it in such a beautiful, unique way. I was surprised, right? So it reminded me to keep my mind open. So this really goes back to Barbara Johnson's classic claim. She's like, the job of the critic is to figure out how to be surprised to rediscover the surprise of otherness, which is the text's infinite disagreement with itself and you. The fact that the text is never self-same. The problem with a classical ideological analysis is it decides in advance what is progressive, what is radical, what is conservative, and then it applies it to the text. Most artists, writers, and filmmakers, while they are certainly a product of their culture, right? Jameson had one thing really right, get a lot of things right, but not everything, right? The idea that people are a product of the complex moment that they're born out of, right? And so he, his idea of the political unconscious is that a text must in some way reflect like the political reality out of which the creator came out of. The problem with Jameson's model is it's too one-to-one. -one. It's too analogical. Like there's like an easy, too easy of a fit between the creator, the text and the ideology. And the reality is most of that relationship between those three levels is wild. It is totally bizarre. I have taught texts that I think of as deeply ideological to students and they will come up with a reading so bizarre that illuminates some aspect of the text I never thought. And why? Because like that student, you know, did little league baseball with their dad when they were a kid and it made them see the world in a certain way. And then they brought that interpretation of the movie. Like that's what's so beautiful. It's like that cannot be captured by my ideological read. So, so the first thing is to suspend your assumptions about what counts as like good politics and bad politics. Ask yourself instead, what, what are the possibilities that this text makes available to my imagination? How does it allow me to see the world differently? And then step two, what might happen if those possibilities landed in the hands of a certain audience that I want to study, right? What would it mean if this text circulated in this other place? Um, so I think that's really always where you start. It's like a, really a space of generosity about like, what is it? what does this make possible? What does it do? I am bored with texts that tend to creatively foreclose possibilities. Right? And those are the ones that I end up doing an ideological read of, where I'm just like, actually, the more I sit with this, the more I feel like the text resists my entering and doing something with it. And why is that imaginatively and creatively? The second thing I would do is ask yourself, like, what is the thing made of? Like, literally and figuratively, what is the text that you're looking at? Like, what are the words in it? What are the forms in it? What is the shape of the page? You know, what, like, what is the actual, like, this is where you get like a real classical literary formalist. Like you actually ask yourself, like, what is the text giving to me in terms of what it's made of? And what are the different meanings I could attach to those elements of the text? This is a good example of this, by the way, if you want to see a great example of this, read David Getze's Abstract Bodies, 60s Sculpture in the Expanded Field of Gender. Talk about a wild book. He basically says that cisgender artists who were doing minimalist sculpture in the 60s were obsessed with the question of gender transitivity. And they began to make sculptures that resisted being nominated by gender. So for instance, he'll talk about John Chamberlain's uh, crushed car part um, uh, sculptures. He would take two cars and smash them together, these huge balls. And he basically says, Chamberlain is imagining two human beings like kissing or having sex or being crushed into each other that you cannot tell what their gender is. Like who thought of that? What an amazing reading to offer like that, th those objects. And that is about opening out the possibilities of connections 
between the text and the historical scene in which it's being produced that are unexpected and surprising. So those are some, I don't know if that's a good answer, but yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for oh, my so pleasure. beautiful ideas and thoughts. Um, I was really taken with the kind of conversation around freedom and friendship. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of thinking about this kind of sense of ownership in friendship. So yeah. I think of like a cultural example, like in Mean Girls, where Greg uh -huh. is like, no, no, I'm the best friend. Sure. You can't come yeah. in here our circle. And I'm wondering like what that kind of a, a dynamic does for the conversation about like inclusivity versus exclusivity. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, part of it is that like, one argument you could make is that's one version of friendship, right? And not necessarily the version of friendship that I celebrate in the book. Um, I kind of celebrate a version of friendship that is fundamentally anti-proprietary, that is against the idea of ownership either of identities or of people or of objects. It is really about free dialogue and free communion. Um, and I think that's something that has to be cultivated between people like over and over and over again. It requires, I say in the book, drawing on a rent, like the practice of promising and forgiving of like making and keeping promises, but then also being willing to forgive when people fail. So in some sense, like um, I actually think with the, the kind of friendship you're describing, oddly enough, is the kind of friendship that contemporary social justice discourse tends to shore up because it is a discourse of proprietary ownership so often. The ownership of identities, a defensive posture, right? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to say something that's like uh, off topic of the thing that you asked. But an example I often use is the way we talk about TERFs, right? So like a lot of the way in which people on the social justice left talk about trans exclusionary radical feminists is that they are so essentialist and they are so conservative about their view of like, they wanna own the, the, the definition of woman. And I often look at my students who hate these kinds of feminists. And I'm like, you say the same thing about race. I'm like, you also are very defensive of the idea of like only black people get to own blackness. Only this group gets to own this identity. And I'm like, you can understand why some feminists believe that they own the category of woman and they didn't want people to encroaching on that category. Is it misguided? Yes. Uh, do I agree with that position? No. I think there's lots of different kinds of women in the world. I think the category is extraordinarily open to transformation, but it would behoove us to think a little bit about the ways we are also very proprietary over our own categories and that there will come a time in the future, you know, goodness willing, if the world changes, when people will look back at us and be like, why were they so obsessed with clinging so fast to those identities, you know? And I think like there is a way in which the conception of friendship I offer in the book is an attempt to get away from that kind of like clinging to proprietary ownership over categories, yeah. Robert, do we have a question? Yeah. No, we don't have a question on, but I'll ask a question. Final thoughts? Sure. Oh, sorry. No, 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 not at all. Um, would you like implore your listeners and other people to let go of that? Um, I guess inclination to yeah, inclination to possess yeah. these identities. Um, and also like can you argue and can you see that like people are so bound to yeah. um, history and the feelings and sentiment and um, residual effects that it's left? Um, and in a sense, because of that, cannot let go of this yes. possession to this identity and understand that like maybe that they never will. Yeah. And is that like, I'm not asking you to like, create a binary and say that's good or that's bad, yeah. but is that like non-progressive? I almost want to talk about it in psychological terms. It's like the clinging is making us miserable. It's literally and figuratively depressing. Like my new work is all about psychedelics and the study of literature. I think it is really, this is like the article I'm writing next is about this, is like, I think it is really interesting that at the same moment that the scientific community is becoming obsessed with psychedelics as a way to treat depression, everyone on the social justice left is obsessed with mental health and is all depressed. We are depressed by our own attachment to identity. 
It makes sense why we are attached to it. I get it. But I would implore people to let go. And I would actually go a step further, which is it's not just about letting go. It's about learning to split decisions, to decide when it makes sense to consolidate Black identity and when to let it go and allow other people access to it to decide when it makes sense to drill down into an identity and when it makes sense to say like, actually, I don't care about identity. A lot of what we do in the world has nothing to do with identity and self-making. Like a lot of what we do every day when we walk around is not consolidated in identity. The fact that our politics have become obsessed with this one thing is really problematic. Like, like we really should question that. Orlando Patterson was making this argument like all the way back in the 70s, one of the most famous black historians of all time saying the best thing that black liberation could do is to release blackness into the world, give it to everybody else and create a new culture. He's like, release your hold on it. And Stephen Best points out that in fact, we did the opposite. We drilled down into our attachment to these identities to a point where like we cannot escape them. So I remind my students all the time, I'm like, look, when you're arguing for gender and sexual freedom, you have to, again, in the form of a split decision, argue for two things at once, at least, right? Probably many things at once. The idea that you want to be able to express your genders and sexualities in as many ways as possible, that's move one. And move two is sometimes to be free of the categories all together. Meaning to have them play a lower weight in your life, not meaning to be fluid, Meaning like, maybe I just don't want gender to matter that much today in my life. And so I find it ironic that they want freedom, but they can't, I'm always joking with them. I'm like, you never stop talking about gender. It's all you ever talk about. I'm like, what about other categories in your life? Is there anything else that you do besides construct a gender and a sexuality? And I don't say that as a judge, judgmentally. I'm honestly looking at them as human to human. And I'm like, I'm exhausted of articulating my sexuality as a gay man or whatever half the time. And I wanna go do something else. And I want the freedom to, to do that. So I would, I would implore us to let go in the, in, in, and to practice learning when to hold on and to let go, right? And, and to me, again, it goes back to communion. It's like, I want my straight friends to feel deep affinity with queerness. I'm okay with them doing it in a clumsy way. Like, I don't feel like I own it. You know, I'm okay. Like, I feel deep communion with my Asian American friends. Would I claim that I'm an Asian American? No, but do I feel that with them, I'm allowed to kind of like trespass on the field? I am because there's trust. I want to allow for that. I mean, that's Gloria Enzel Dua 101. She's like, listen, I have friends who really don't want to give white people the time of day, but I do. She's like, I love some of those people. They're like my closest friends. And so I really do want to implore us to let go because it would allow us to start fighting for our collective communion and stop fighting each other. Like, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's really great. Thank you. By the way, can I quickly say to the audience, this last point that I made, that's what Wakanda Forever is all about. You should go see it. It's astounding. It's literally all about the idea that when two groups of people are too deeply grounded in their woundedness, they will destroy each other rather than the system that is killing them. It's so smart. It's very beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's oh my God, I was, sh I was shook. I was like literally shaking at the end. It was amazing, yeah. Thank you all so much.